Yo, 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 fam. What is up? Welcome in on another Friday to the Friday edition of the Best Damn Agency Podcast. You already know what it is. This is Sales on the Rocks, where ironically we drink bourbon straight. Uh, But this is the unfiltered, uh, unscripted conversation about all things agency ownership, life, and of course, agency sales. I am the captain of this ship, uh, but really the one you need to watch out for is my partner in crime here. That is none other than Joey Gilkey, founder, Coming CEO of Sales Driven Agency. What's up? Hey, dude. Coming for it. How are you? The captain of my ship, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really, I've said this before, I'm, I'm captaining a house of five people and I guess now half a company, but that's really about it in my life. So still a lot, man. And it's all women. Oh, you just got a lot of, lot of girls around you. There's a lot of feelings in my house. Um, <laughs> it's a funny story. And do you have last the majority night? of them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I've, I've got big feelings, too. So it makes for a Molotov cocktail, uh, not to be insensitive to what's happening in Ukraine right now. So <laughs> um, <laughs> last night, we've got these little miniature ice cream cones that are dairy-free. They're like these cute little pre-packaged ice cream cones that yeah. my wife gets from Aldi. They are notorious for like falling apart. So the way that they make these things, I don't know how they make them, but like once you unwrap them, if you lick the top of the ice cream cone too hard, the top scoop just like falls on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so like I figured this out. My wife has figured this out. Our three-year-old has somehow figured this out. And even my, my infant, my one-year-old can eat these ice cream cones. My six-year-old, every time we, we get them, her ice cream falls on the floor. And every time she has this just massive meltdown about her. And I have, I feel no pity for her because it's like the sixth no. time her ice cream has fallen on the floor. I'm like, <sighs> buddy, damn just, shame. you got to own it, man. This some, she's learning extreme ownership at six years old. Own she your did not shit. get another ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, I, I have uh, my own your shit neon sign accidentally covered for this episode. I don't feel like changing it at this point. I was creating some content for a new offer of ours and turn the neon sign off and put bottles in front of it. <clears throat> I'm fake. It's all good, man. I love it. I know, man, you're not fake. I love the own your shit slogan. Uh, I do sort of <laughs> regret that we had those t-shirts made because I can't wear mine anywhere. I just feel bad <laughs> going out in public with my kids with an own your shit t-shirt on. You can just wear it while you're having sex with your wife. Mm, I, I'm typically shirtless. <laughs> are, are, do you, do, no, do you wear a shirt? Sh- no. <laughs> You like the fat point. guy at the pool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I keep my socks on and my shirt. <laughs> I've got a uniform. Oh, man. That's amazing. Speaking of swag. Yeah, I am what are you wearing? Repping. Oh, where am I on the camera here? Yeah, watch us on YouTube if you're not, by the way. This is the Tahoe, B-Dam Tahoe North Face hoodie. Uh, for the March retreat of the best damn agency mastermind. So yep, we don't we don't, uh, we don't cut corners on our swag. Oh, no, when we do it, we, we get the expensive nice. stuff. Well, you said it. You said if we're going to pay for it, I want to wear it and enjoy it. And so that's correct. What we did. I mean, I wouldn't go to uh, as we are recording. We are currently actually in Lake Tahoe. When you're and not recording this, but when you hear this audio, uh, we are in Lake Tahoe. Riding snowmobiles, workshopping each other's businesses, and making each other better while drinking delicious beverages and having a hell of a time. So, and having a private chef make a sushi and mm. all that fun mm. stuff, too. Don't worry about it, guys. Next go around, we have two a year. So, if you want to jump in the mastermind, go to bestamagency.co. That's enough of a pitch. It's enough of a pitch. Um, let's step into a super fun conversation to kick this thing off. So, fun by whose standards? <laughs> oh man, fun by those who show up every week and listen to our bullshit on this all show. Right, cool. I'm sure they're going to enjoy it. So fun for you and me. That's really all I care about. We're going to sip some whiskey. What, what are you drinking before we step into this? This is a 111 proof Ooh. Uh, Chattanooga Whiskey Company. And let's see. I think it's their special reserve, like um, special barrel. It's really good. Sweet. It's right here. Uh, I'm drinking a rabbit hole, their cave hill bourbon that we used. Mm. Uh, we put that together for a client. So I'm, nice. I'm finishing up the bottles I got before I buy anything new. All right. I'll now like back it. to it. So, okay. Bring it. I'll set it up. I'll set it up like this. Yeah. So 
dude, I don't even remember exactly what prompted me. Maybe it was a conversation you and I had yesterday where we were talking about certain things. I will mm -hmm. I'll keep it veiled for a second. And I'm looking up stuff and I found a couple of really good podcasts. Um, and so I'm at the gym. It's early in the morning. And I, that's, I just think, I sit, I listen to good stuff. Dude, my mind was exploding in the gym as I'm <laughs> listening to all of this unfold. And then it's, I'm the guy that when I hear a point made or, or an idea exposed that I haven't heard before, like I just want to understand all of it. So I was doing research for the next four hours, uh, just trying to dig in and understand. So I've heard the term great reset thrown around. Okay. Um, I've heard of the, is it the World Economic Forum? Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. WEF. Yeah. It's like some WEF. So some of these, like I've heard of the names of these organizations tossed around, but as I'm starting to understand the implications of some of the things that are happening and some of the agendas that exist, uh, it is scary as shit. So mm -hmm. why don't you just lay out in a, whatever feels like the most pertinent component of this, like okay. what it is that is, what is happening, who is doing it, and what is scary about the agendas at hand? Cool. For yeah, us. so... The Great Reset is something that if you go to the World Economic Forum, which is a legitimate organization known on the global level, uh, they have a page or a section or whatever. Just type in WEF -E Great Reset. So this isn't like some veiled plan that nobody's talking about and it's conspiracy. It's like a legitimate thing that there are the powers that be desire to accomplish the Great Reset. And a lot of people believe that uh, the phases of it are already well underway. So what is the Great Reset? Um, it is a reset of our global economy where um, we move more towards a globalist society instead of uh, living in our siloed nations operating under our individual governments, on our individual currency models, under whatever our specific where we live operates underneath and moving more towards a globalist society where we are kind of run on all one currency system. We uh, are governed by relatively one global uh, government, if you will. And um, if you look it up and you look at the video, uh, if you could type in, I forget who it was exactly who said it, but it's a, a well-renowned individual who said something along, along the lines of you will own nothing and you will be better for it or, or happier for it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so it's essentially like we will own nothing because it will all belong to the globalist government and we will essentially be leasing all these things. Um, basically, we're moving towards a, a socialist world. That is yeah. essentially the Great Reset. These people who basically leverage the concept that capitalism is evil irony we'll get into that but um they believe capitalism is evil and it has created all the evil and so we need to have a great reset in the world all right now i know you're watching that video i don't mean to interrupt but i'm going to because i would be remiss if i did not tell you about sales driven agency my company i'm the ceo of sales driven agency we work specifically with digital marketing agencies to build out the sales operation what is the sales operation you ask well in order for you to become a predictable, sustainable, scalable agency, it has to come from having a well-oiled sales operation, which is sales processes, sales systems and frameworks. How do we get repeatable outcomes? Salespeople. How do you go find the salespeople? How do you hire them? How do you train them? How do you manage them when they do start? How do you set them up for success? What does enabling the sales team look like? How do you build out the tech stack? What's the CRM and sales engagement and proposals? meeting structure, scripts, templates, what do those things look like? Well, you don't have to figure those things out because you likely will never be able to. That's why we exist. Sales Driven Agency, we architect your sales processes. We build out your tech stack. We hire and train your salespeople for you. We will recruit them. We will hunt them. We will even build the compensation plan for you. We will build the training to make sure they're successful. We will train you on how to manage them once we're gone. And on top of that, we will guarantee our success, a 5x minimum return on your investment in the six months we work together, and you will have an entire sales operation built for you. We build the car, we teach you to drive it, we hand you the keys and walk away. If you're interested in having your digital agency have the sales operation built for you so you can scale 
and grow, become predictable, sustainable, and scalable, go to www.salesdrivenagency.com. You can also click the link below. Again, salesdrivenagency.com. Go book a call or click the link below and book a call. Then my name is Joey Gilkey. I'm going to send you back to the video. Hope you enjoy. Hope you'll also check us out at salesdrivenagency.com. So I've actually heard, so you've got the World Economic Forum. Klaus Schwab is who you were talking about. He's the one mm-hmm. that, like if you go to the, he, he founded, uh, I listened to his sort of like biography pieces of it uh, today, actually. I, I've done a lot of digging today, but founded this <laughs> in uh, 1971 and it's really just been expanding it. And like, the people that sit on the board of this thing, Bill Gates is a part of it. Yep. Um, like government leaders, uh, one of the organizers of the Fed, of the Treasury, like people who with significant economic and global pull sit on the board of the World Economic Forum. And they're all aligned around these ideas of, like you said, globalization and and equality and more of a centralized uh, like distribution of power or system of distribution of power. Yeah. Um, that is that is like the official thing, the Great Reset. That is the the framework that is being, uh, I guess, carried out in some ways. But then mm. on the other side of of the equation, you have people talking about this thing, the Great Reset, that is more like a grassroots. Um, you know, it, it's it's driven by like people who primarily just care for like social reform. Uh, yeah. And it's like on the on the hind end of COVID and lockdowns and all of the injustice that was front and center in mass media, like people want, people are starting to believe that a great reset, maybe in a more like localized fashion should be something that the, the people, not the institutions, but the mm. people play a part in creating. Do you see the differentiation in those two things? Like, do you see that like those as two separate things, or do you feel like it's all still under the umbrella of this bigger overarching idea? I think it's both. I do do think it's both. And I think that the bigger overarching idea is influencing the grassroots localization of it. Okay. It's part of their plan. Mass adoption is going to happen at the grassroots level, even though it's controlled at a central point up top with the elites. That's my mm, theory. Okay. Right. So the thing that, that that comes to mind immediately for me on both sides, um, and I don't know if they would go so far as to say this, but it's just like Marxist ideology. Yeah, it's right? like that's what it is. It's yeah, it is what it is. Um and, and so like I studied economics in college, I studied Marxism in college. Um, you know, I had to read Atlas Shrugged as like one of my entry level books into the, the economics program. So I, I did some like brushing up on Marx, Karl Marx's actual teachings and ideologies. And this is what they wrote. Or he Dude, wrote, you've been busy uh, as or one fuck. Of the, <laughs> I, I, I've been a nervous wreck. You're a rabbit so one of, the, one of the tenets of his belief, so he believes that there is an elite class called the bourgeoisie. There's a working class called the proletariat. Eventually, the uh, unequal distribution of power will force, it will necessitate the working class to kind of facilitate this uprising um, and overthrow or, or push back against the elitist class. Mm. He, so I, I, re- I read this as I was summing up his beliefs. Marxism assumes that the elites will employ social institutions, including government. So listen to this. Government, media, Finance. academia, organized religion, and banking and the financial systems as tools and weapons against the working class with the goal of maintaining their position of power and privilege. Okay, so so Marx, who is against capitalism, mm-hmm. says that capitalist leaders, business leaders with this unequal distribution of power will utilize all of these systems to keep the people like under their thumb. Yeah. But what I see happening in this move towards the great reset as the left, the extreme left like rises up for you know and 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 perpetu- uh, uh, perpetrates big government it fights for big government i see them leveraging academia and institutions and the financial systems to media yeah media and, and they say that they're doing it in the name of like creating equality but i really think like the outcome is going to be that the people that facilitate this great reset they're going to be the people with and there's the still going to be people without the money. Yeah, correct. Yeah, you know the, so the, the same thing's going to happen again. The same the the saying that Claus Schwab said was, 
you know, you're going to own nothing, but you're going to have stuff, right? So you're going to have homes and whatever. I want you to think about real estate. That's just to use it as, as an example. Who stands to gain from real estate? The landlord. What? Yeah. Yep. The bank and the government from the taxes. And so similarly, they will own everything. You will own nothing. You will lease it from them. Who stands to gain from it? The landlord, which in this case, mm. the landlord, the government, and the banking and financial institutions will all be owned by the same people. And so they benefit from all of it. Yeah. That's what we're Dude, moving so what I, What I feel like, my takeaway from this was, <laughs> so Abigail, I'm so glad you're on this train. <laughs> Well, I've been I, on I, this I do for so these, long. <laughs> <laughs> I, I go down these rabbit holes. They freak me out. Um, but then I hit this place where I just want to like learn and learn and learn and learn and learn and like consume and and like try to figure out an action plan. The thing is, like, there's not really an action plan. Like, if you want to no. talk about what you can do to stop this from happening, there's Nothing. not one. And so, my, so two thoughts. One, if you're listening to this, thank you for putting up with a bit of a rant on a, on a kind of off center topic. Um, but I think it's important to know and be informed. Like Joey said, this is happening. There are incredibly powerful people. Many of the world's wealthiest, most powerful people who, who orchestrate and run the biggest governments in the world. China showed up at the, uh, the world economics forums gathering in 2022. Um, like Chinese leadership was there. Yeah. CCP. Um, Chinese. Yeah. And, and, and so, People with a lot of clout mm -hmm. are are working towards the end. So if you don't know about it, if you've not familiarized yourself with it, if you don't know what it is, like wake up. You are asleep, yep. and they are doing what they want, and you are just a part of this game that is happening. And it's um, moving. The fast. second piece. Well, the second, my second thought and question to you, Joey, is like, what can you do other yep. than be informed? What What do you do with all this when you recognize that it's reality? Um. Well, one is accept the inevitable, which is you can't. Which is you, what? Which you you cannot make a difference in this at a at a macro level, okay. Um, and then it's you've got to become proactive about how you're going to be reactive to it. It's really it. Like hmm. you're not going to be proactive in the sense that you're going to beat it per se. It's how are you going to react to it by thinking about how you're going to react to it. So it's being proactive about how you're going to be reactive. Because we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. We don't know what the exact powers that be, who they are. I think there's a, a lot. We talked about this yesterday. I think there's a lot of people, different groups who are, they're all kind of on the same interstate, but they've all got different lanes and different exits. And so they're okay with pushing the traffic that direction. But they've all got different end goals, so they're still technically fighting against each other. But in the name, it's basically the my enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, um, mm -hmm. like Josh said yesterday. And so, I think it's important to, to realize is that there's a, there's a lot of pieces moving. You can't do anything about it unless you become some uh, global elitist and <laughs> you want to infiltrate this group. More power to you. I don't know how to make a billion dollars personally. Um, but there's probably a hundred people in the world that are in, you know influencing this for the 8 billion, 9 billion of us that there are. And so I don't know. There's, there's a whole lot you can do, except I would, I would look at socialist and communist countries and how they are run and how anybody in those socialist or communist countries thrived in those times, because though it's not going to look identical to that, it's going to have a lot of elements of that. If you look at any socialist country or communist, let's take Cuba, North Korea, most of China, like there's the elites who live well and everybody else is poor. Hmm. So yeah, preparing I think now addition, for that. So, so the casualties in all of this, to me, it's, uh, it is the Republic of the United States, the democracy upon which we were founded and the freedoms that again, ha have, have, really been this, what saturated what our country's been for, for 300 years, 200 and however Well, years, I would actually argue years. and say we start as a republic, we became a democracy, and we're leading towards a socialist society. That's what I, yeah, and, and I agree with right, that so too. Republic, I, think, I think the republic has already fallen, right? The republic is ruled by the people, 
I think a democracy is ruled by the leaders that the people so-called put into office. And then socialism is just ruled by the elites. Anyways, keep going. No, you're good. So we're here to talk about sales and we're going to talk about sales. And no, I'm not one of the 100 people that's going to have a massive impact on how this plays out. But I feel like it's one of those, you and I talked about this two years ago. I've been happy to live my life, stay in my lane and put my head in the sand when it comes to most things, um, you know, geopolitical. Yep. This is one where you, I just don't think you can do that. Like you can put your head in the sand, but when you pull it out, the world that you find around you is going to look a lot different than it did. And that's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. We're not talking about. They're already making the chess moves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ukraine and 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 Russia, you don't think that there's a bigger agenda behind that. You don't, you know, not to get super political, but like, (laughs) fuck, I'm always political. Who cares? (laughs) (laughs) Not to get what I always am. (laughs) Uh, I mean, like the, how the media has spun it instantly, how there's all the unifying stories that come to, you know, end up not being true. Like there is an agenda. So here's the other thing. So there's the, the woke left, which are typically the ones who jump on with social justice movements. So look at black lives matters or LGBTQ communities and rights and, um, those types of, of groups when those people stop screaming from the rooftops about black lives matter or LGBTQ, and they start screaming from the rooftops about we stand with Ukraine, Ukraine and all those kind of things, all the media and the powers behind the media are just weaponizing the woke left who are ignorant to these social causes. They're leveraging social things to move the needle for their agenda. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not even a conspiracy. It's just used logical thinking. Like that's exactly what they're doing. Like you, so I would encourage you guys to go watch. Um, I think it's called um, uh, X KGB agent, Russian agent. Oh yeah, talks about um, the United States, and I forget exactly what it is, but it looks like a video from like the nineteen eighty, early nineteen eighties, and um, it's him just talking about the different phases of mm. turning a country, or turning a nation, or turning a power and the areas in which they infiltrate. And, and one of the areas he talks about are the woke people. He didn't call them woke, but that's basically what he's saying. And he says, is they will use you like the pawns that you are, and then you will be the first to burn at the stake when it's time. So, sorry. Yep. You know, what like you me. say, it's only, conspiracy. <laughs> it's only conspiracy until it happens or something like it's that. It's only conspiracy until <laughs> it's true. I'm okay to be wrong uh, in your eyes for now. But there will become a day where me being wrong and me preparing according to what I believed is proven true. And you thought I was crazy or anyone who holds these quote unquote conspiracy. Listen, the word conspiracy, if you look it up on like Google search and you look at the amount of times conspiracy or conspiracy theorists or conspiracy theories has been used over the years has just gone out the roof because it has now become a weaponized word. If someone disagrees with you, you're all of a sudden a conspiracy theorist. And so now that because we've made it a negative connotation, Mm -hmm. I can slap a label on you and shut your conversation down by just calling you conspiracy theorist. Even though it's just me questioning status quo or I'm questioning how things are done. It's good. Um, I think to tack on to what you said about current events, you know, what's happening with COVID or Ukraine and Russia, whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't even necessarily think it has to be uh, somebody that's like pulling the strings and starting the Russia Ukrainian war sure. uh, with like, I-, I think it could just be the powers in play leveraging those situations, manipulating what's happening during those situations to accelerate the outcomes that they want. Yeah. Uh, I think either of those could potentially. Well, and I have my so, theories on what's going on with the Russia Ukraine thing, but we don't have time to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, if you really want that, come back next week or we'll just start a separate podcast and all the things that. I think uh, we should start. Sorry, you got to, you got to come to Knoxville though. Cause it's way cooler when you just have in person. All right, we'll do it. Um, you heard it here first. T- TBD when that's going to happen. And what it will have nothing to do best. with business. <laughs> the best damn I don't know, it's gonna be called wake damn. the fuck up <laughs> <laughs> yeah i like that oh, i like that so much all right let's jump into sales let's talk business um well before we get into sales business first so yep. just kind of more specific or more generally um i mentioned the retreat that we're currently on as this airs so the mm-hmm. tahoe retreat and you left a, a voice message for the members in our group saying, hey, this, this is going to be a pivotal like moment. This is going to be yeah. 
uh, a time that you look back on and see a lot of change that takes place from this. So go ahead and prepare yourself. And I was wondering for you, as somebody who's attended a bunch of things like this, I'm sure people listening have gone to retreats, they've gone to conventions, yeah. they've gone to summits, they've gone to all the things. Like, what does it mean to you to prep for and then effectively get the max value out of something like this? Yeah, well, I think that oftentimes the flip side of the coin is I think it's it's not uncommon that we go to masterminds or group coaching or events, conferences, whatever. And we just kind of go as a spectator and as a reactionist, like I'm going to come and just be reactive to whatever happens. Now there's a level to that where it's like, Hey, I have really low expectations. And so therefore I want to be surprised because it exceeded my pretty low bar to set where, but for me, like I'm a boss to the wall kind of guy. I'm going to tell you to set an extremely high bar. I'm still going to jump over that shit. That's the way Mm -hmm. I think. And so I want people to come in and be thinking actively about where are, couple things. One, where do I want to grow as a man? Where do I want to grow as a business leader? Where do I want to grow financially, spiritually? Where do I want to grow relationally with other people? Um, those are the things that I want people to be asking the questions about. And if you're not thinking about those, it might happen. You might get answers to questions you didn't know you were supposed to be asking. But I think that if you start thinking proactively about these things and say, hey, I'm going into an environment where I'm going to, I'm, I'm literally, I told the guys this, I was like, listen, you guys are leaving your families. You're leaving your wife and your kids at home. You're leaving your business to your employees and you're, you're getting away for four days to have a shit ton of fun, to make memories. But you're also there, like that's a big sacrifice. So go into it and prepare for it. Right? Yeah. And, and if you do that, like we are cultivating an environment where that preparation that you do will we're cultivating that environment so it'll mm. it will it will help those things come to fruition and blossom and we've talked about reticular activating systems and things like that before where it's like when you start preparing yourself and you start having beliefs and you start setting your mind on things like naturally your brain it has a heightened awareness of the things that lend to or lead to that thing or support that core belief and so my, my hope is that these guys come into it, and I know they will because they did last time, but come into it with an open mind, thinking big, having big problems they want to solve, um, relationships they want to build, and then when they show up, like set the expectations super high and then have us destroy it by being even better. It's the same way that I would treat a client in a consulting or a you know project type engagement, right? If they walk in, and they don't have any idea what they want to get out of it. You know, one, I probably don't want to work with them or yeah. if I, I want to define that for them. Um, What's but the, the win? person who knows what they want. Yeah. If they know what their win is, if there's a benchmark that's been created, the chances of us surpassing that or, or at least getting to it are way higher than if they haven't even yeah. thought about it. Yeah. Um, that, that's and your win might uh, shift like a little bit, but I think having intention, that was the word I kept using in the, the voice message. It's like, we have built this with intention. I think you should show up with intention and not just go yep. there because we're going to have cool, fun stuff to do. You're going to be hanging out with a bunch of awesome, successful dudes and you're going to have really amazing food and drinks and all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, that's going to happen. But what else? Like, this is a sacrifice. It's not just a vacation. I'm getting fired up for Tahoe. I want to be there right now. <laughs> too, it's going to be great. We are, technically, when you guys are listening to this. Well, technically, when this airs, <laughs> yes. All right, sales. So... Talked to an agency today, super interesting. Uh, They call themselves a consultancy, which typically you and I know is just a a way to make agencies sound fancy. Yeah. Um, (laughs) We we started talking about their ideal customer profile. They've never done outbound. Mm -hmm. My question is, who do you want to serve? Like when we start targeting accounts and building lists, who do you go after? (laughs) And this guy came back at me and he's like, well, let me just rattle off some names for you. Uh, and he said, Microsoft, Apple, NASDAQ. Facebook, <laughs> uh, no, uh, NVIDIA, the chip yeah. manufacturer. And, and you know, so somebody else typed in there real quick, like, okay, so Fang, the Fang stocks is basically this guy's ideal customer profile. So he's, what I love about this guy that I met is like, he told me on the call, he's hyper competitive. He, he has... Uh, aggressive growth goals okay. and so he wants to go after these huge accounts and they've got like to his uh to his credit they've got twitter they've got some business with apple they, like they've got some of these big companies um and they've like 
landed a project there and then expanded into like a higher level component of their business. Yeah. And so my question is like, is that even, is that a decent idea to, to like craft this just kind of next level shoot for the stars type ideal customer profile? So maybe for, for those listening, it's not the, the FANG stocks, but sure. maybe it's, hey, I only want to work with, you know, Fortune 100 companies with, you know, uh, $100 million ad spend or, you know, whatever it is, like, it is it good to set the bar that high? Someone's got to work with them. That's my theory. And, and I think that I, I personally would not want to work at that level because they want to control everything. And that would be a really shitty client to have <clears throat> personally. Um, but I can understand why people would want to go work with them and have those marquee labels. And, you know, depending on your end goals, I think that's someone has to work with them. So why not you? Um, if, if that's what you truly believe, and you truly believe you can help them and you've got proof that you can help them. Like, sure. I think it's okay to, to shoot for that. They're just at the end of the day, the, the strategy and campaign structuring might be different, but the principles are the same. I'm dealing with a human or humans inside of Apple who make mm-hmm. decisions to solve problems. I have a solution to solve that problem, not to deal with humans to convince them that we're the best fit to solve this problem with our solution. And so instead of, you know, but what I would say is, hey, you don't, you're not aiming for Apple. You're aiming for Jim, the VP of social or VP of SEO. Yeah. Um, and all the people around him. And so I think that's how you have to just change your frame of mind is, is go after the individuals in those companies. And, and you'll have to do a more, account, I mean, you'll, you will have to do an account based approach. You're not going to get into those accounts by brute force necessarily. And so you really got to stand a, out. Sorry. Go ahead. This company's done a really good job of, you know, getting that director level, EVP level contact, winning a module of business and then expanding in. Like, yes. What I hear you saying is that's probably the best way to approach this. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my question then is we've talked about um, account based sales, we've talked about standing out in the way that you run campaigns. I mean, it, is it the exact same thing, right? Like, if you're, if you're going after a $100 million company and you're trying to, attract the attention of their CMO and you're getting really creative in how you approach them to stand out from the crowd. Like, is it the same thing if you're going after yeah. the, the, the head of social at a, a Fang stock company? Yeah. I think what you do is you develop your company account list first. So who are the accounts want to work with? And then I think that you look internally at the positions that either lead the charge on the solution that you provide or those who facilitate those people. And so I think you have to now take an approach where I, I will always have a, a top-down approach, right? Where it's, I'm going to start as high as humanly possible in the organization as it relates to the problem that I saw. Who is the CEO of the problem that we solve? Not the CEO of the company. That might be them. But who is the CEO of this particular problem? Um, and then from there, I make my decision on who I go after first. Mm-hmm. I work them through my account-based approach. Somewhere in the middle of that, I inject someone else into that process and I treat them as my my point of contact. Because what's going to happen is if you start at the top and you do get their attention and you realize they don't make the decision, they're going to pass you down to someone, the person that gets sent the opportunity from above them will take that meeting. Now, but if you start from the bottom, it's a lot harder to climb the ladder of decision makers because the advice to take the meeting is coming from below you. And so you want to take more of a top of the pyramid down approach. But nonetheless, you should define who the who that people who those people are and work through that process. Yeah, it's it's insightful. We might have mentioned this one other time on the podcast, but I think it's worth restating because um even if you don't get a chance to have a high level conversation with the CMO, but then they send you to a marketing director or a head of a certain yeah. silo and you can even just use their name. Like, hey, Jim sent me to have a conversation with you or said yes. we need to set up a time to talk. It doesn't have to be that you had a, an hour long conversation with Jim, just using his name in a conversation and getting the contact info from him or whatever, right? Like that's yeah. that's going to build authority and trust and get you a meeting. So, well, and here's a badass um, approach that, that I've talked about. Um, I don't think I've actually talked about this in the, maybe I have, it would have been one time maybe where um, I was actually talking about to one of the guys in the mastermind with their approach is, is have your like three key people in your account that you want to get in front of and you want to work through top down. So let's just say you've got 
chief level or C level, VP level, director level as like your three that you're going to go after. We'll go after the C suite first, run them through a campaign, um, you know, six to 13, six to 15 touch points, higher touch, touch points. They fall at the bottom of that. Great. Move on to the VP. Same thing. Move on after that to the director. Let's just say hypothetically, you get there, all three of those people, you don't get any traction. Then a cool tactic is send an email to all three of them on the same email and say, hey, Jim, Sally, and Rick, I've tried. I've worked my ass off to try to get a hold of one of you three. Here's what we do. I don't know which one of you three is the best person to talk to. <laughs> you guys tell me. And maybe you can Good. like show like I've sent 14 emails, this many phone calls, sent you guys gifts and handwritten letters and connected on social. Like you could have these stats there. I'm at a loss for words at this point. I don't typically get this far. So I'm going to CC all three of you. You guys tell me who should I talk to? Yeah. You're going to, I mean, it's That's gonna a do well. it, it's killer. That's a killer. Like wrap up the campaign, you know, pull the parachute if you get nothing else. Like a lot of times I'm sending like a last ditch effort email, but that one itself like is the tactic and it feels like that mm-hmm. would work really well. And you get you know, the funny thing is you can start it and end it that way. And you can say, hey, listen, I've got like, you, you go, hey, hey, Jim, Sally and Rick, uh, I'm about to go Blitzkrieg bop on. On you guys, and I'm going to go after each one of you sequentially until I get an answer on who I'm supposed to talk to. So before I go through all that and I send this many emails, this many blah, 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 this many that, Ooh, who I like do I that need too. to talk to? And then you, they don't answer. You go through your whole thing where you go after all of them and you say, hey, I sent you an email back on February 12th trying to get a hold of you guys. I went through. I did as many touch points as I told you I'd do, email, LinkedIn, whatever. I'm still at a loss. I don't think this is a lost cause. I know we can help you guys. Who do I need to talk to? So you can almost sandwich your entire campaign strategy with your buyer personas on the front end and on the back end together and then have campaigns yeah. in the middle for each one of them individually. If we're talking 10 touch points per person, 30 touch points, I mean, we're looking at potentially like months of engagement just to get a meeting. That does not make sense if you're doing small deals. <laughs> No, you can't. But I if mean, you're working, you in have the, to be the, doing quarter million dollar, five hundred thousand dollar, million. Which is plus. why it applies to the scenario that I gave you, right? Because we're yeah. talking about. I mean, it's, he he was telling me today, like a lot of the deals they're landing are you know hundred k a month, two hundred k a month mm-hmm. type deals. So there, there's money to be made, but getting the attention of a decision maker of those you know three potential key entry points yeah. could take you. And the months. good thing is, you're not just going after Apple this quarter, sure. right? It's, I'm going to go after Apple, Facebook, Amazon, blah, 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 all the way down the list. And so some are going to convert on your first email. Some are going to convert on your 10th. Some are not going to convert until your 43rd, right? And so I said email, it's any touch point or any, any, you know, uh, entry point. But uh, you should be doing this all year long and you should be recycling and doing circle back campaigns and trying it again, trying a different angle, trying something new, adding a little bit more, upping your your cost per acquisition threshold, what you're willing to pay to get this meeting. Because I guarantee yeah. you, if you're, if you're charging a million dollars for a service, like you could probably spend 10 grand on getting that account. Probably. That's, that seems to scale pretty well. If like back of the envelope numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You I'll, could run I'll that so. a hundred times over. Yeah. That's great. Okay. I don't want to sit here too long. But just thinking through this scenario where you've got a company that's wanting to go after a bunch of high profile companies, they they sell a really technical service that's not even worth explaining right now, uh, more technical than most agencies that we work with. Mm-hmm. Um, who do you hire? Like if you're hiring a sales rep to to go be a part of this, I know you like we've talked a lot about how foot in the door becomes pivotal. They don't even really have like they sell so many different things from so many different directions. And that could be a whole nother question that we address yeah. in this conversation. But who do you hire to facilitate For them this conversation? Specifically, yeah. someone who has yeah. an enterprise experience and you give them an assistant. Okay. That's what and, I would And do. what is that? What's that hire? Like, what are you expecting to pay? I'm probably paying them 120 grand base salary. Plus commission. Plus commission. Yeah. Okay. That's what you got to do. I mean, if those are the accounts you want, you got to have somebody who's got the chops to get into them, who's willing to to work those, and who can actually nurture them when he gets in it. 
he or she. So, okay. I mean, All maybe right. not 120. I mean, you can get away with maybe less, but why would you want to? You know, like if your if your deals are as big as you say they are, then 120 grand is nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's worth it. The ROI is worth it. Um, let's go back to the foot in the door idea. Like they don't have one. They don't even really have like a unified specific like tip of the spear like a yeah they don't have an offer that they lead with um because they come in horizontally at a bunch of different entry points they work with different teams they do some product dev they do um i I don't know man i literally couldn't tell you what they do i (laughs) talked to them for an hour and a half and i the whole time like just tried to sound like i knew what i was talking about right they're yeah they're basically like a product development product product design development shop so they do product management, they, you know. They like, do some marketing. They do a, like high level consulting. They do, they have there's like a lot of things that they they do in there. Um, sounds boring. Do you? Yeah, it's a lucrative though. Um, <laughs> do you need to have that one specific front end offer that you know if you hire somebody they can come and say hey we sell this thing now we have this suite of services that that we can use to to expand what we do but like mm-hmm. here's where we start with everybody. I mean, the answer is yes and no. Like, I would advise them to for sure. Um, I'd also be curious, like, if you're going at that level, like, do you have to play the RFP game? You know, because you play the yeah. RFP yeah. game, like, you're kind of playing by their rules. That's why I hate that world. That's why I personally yep. would not sell enterprise to that level um, with it with a saturated thing like marketing. Um, so that would be one thing. But I mean, I think that. It's a differentiator if you have, hey, I don't care how everyone else, every other agency is pandering to you. We know how to get the results. Here's how we do it. It starts with this step. It's $25,000. We're going to get in. Mm-hmm. We're going to spend 30 days together. My team's going to be devoted to your your whatever problem for 30 days. We're going to diagnose and prescribe a plan. And then we'll get into an engagement having the exact plan that we know we need to do instead of guessing based on what you think you need. Yeah, that's what I would do. And I would craft an offer around that and have it be some sort of strategic audit style. I mean, you're just getting paid 25 grand to do a proposal instead of everyone else is going to throw their proposal at you because they're like, I want to work with Apple, so I'll do whatever they want. I don't care what it costs me, even if it's... Never mind. Um, Yeah. I was going to say something very sexual. I didn't. I'm glad you didn't. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for having restraint. (laughs) No, so it's basically, it's a foot in the door... At a much higher level. Yeah. It's a paid engagement. You know, if you're charging a million dollars, like 25 grand. And you just come at the the posture of like, dude, at the end of the day, like, I can tell you right now, we could charge you $100,000 a month based on what you think you need, which I'm not saying you're wrong. But what if you are? Or what if you're right, but you're not completely right? And there's more to this. Or what if... What if I would charge you 100 grand, but what if I actually would only charge you 50 grand a month because I think we could solve the problem with less resources over here? I just think that it's an opportunity to really prove, oh, like these guys are mm. for us. So, I mean, that's yeah, putting the door offer, gateway offer, you know, tip of the spear offer, whatever you want to call it. Um, okay. I think it's advantageous for every organization, okay. even including enterprise. Period. Like, is that every, every organization? Period. Agency, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. Okay. Every agency. Um, like right now, I'm, I'm going through a website development. Someone's scoping the project for me. He spent all his time in the slide deck and I've made a lot of assumptions and he quoted me like 97 grand for like this thing. And I was like, I don't need this stuff. But if you'd have been like, hey, let's spend 2,500 bucks on like really scoping this out. We'll wireframe some things and do these things. He probably would have found out that I would have pulled the trigger right after that on a twenty thousand dollar development. But he's yeah. making a bunch of assumptions yeah. on what I need without really doing a whole lot of deep dive. And so hmm. I don't know. I wish more people would sell to me with a foot in the door offer. Love it. So I'm not spending ninety seven grand it. on a website. I'm too good at outbound <laughs> sales to want to invest ninety seven <laughs> yeah, grand to a website. Right. <laughs> yeah, we'll make your website your best salesperson. No, you won't. You <laughs> literally can't. Sales. <laughs> yeah. My salesperson last uh, week closed three deals. Uh, 
So. Our new salesperson who just started two months ago. Yes. He's kicking ass. He uh, one today. That's great. I love it. Yep. He's also doing push-ups so you, with us. I know. We're doing a push-up challenge. I got to go get I gotta get on it today. Today's been a weird day. I've been freaking talking about rabbit hole. Uh, great, great reset. Yeah. Um, you, you are a sales like guy, you know, a lot about this stuff, obviously, but you, how dare seen you, you do assume it. my gender? You, I know I'm a terrible. I'm person. a sales actually, them. Dude, I say that all the time and I catch myself now because <laughs> culture has made me so aware. <laughs> I'm like, really appreciate you guys. And I'm waiting for the, there eventually one day somebody will be like, fuck you. Yeah, probably. I'm, I'm a, th- I'm a they. I'm like, all right. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a th- thought. <laughs> um, I want to know about how you do, like, if you run a self-diagnostic mm-hmm. on your sales operation and how things are currently going, I don't want to know what that looks like. I want to know what you do with specific findings. So, like, okay, so go to, you go to the doctor, you find out that you're overweight, or you find out that you've got yeah. your heart, your blood, blood pressure is high, right? Like, yep. there's, like, a next... What do you do with that? a second-level dig, Yeah. Um, so a couple specifically, and I know we've talked about this recently, like if your deal velocity slows down, so if mm-hmm. you're, cause you're on top of your numbers, if yep. you know your deal velocity is slowing, what are the next few things that you are checking or, or then going to fix? That's great. Uh, cause that is true. Ours, our deal velocity has lengthened currently and our close rate on outbound has dropped slightly. Um, Neither of which are concerning because the volume is really good, but um, those are things that I'm currently optimizing for. So I, um, as it relates to the deal velocity, um, I think you need to have deal velocity for inbound and outbound because they're very different. Like we had three inbound leads come in last week. We closed two of the three in one week. Okay. Outbound's taking like 30 days to close, 40 days um, on average. And so... A lot of it's because you don't have trust built in and those kind of things. So my next inclination is, okay, well, the only reason it's going so long is a couple things. Either we're not leading them well enough, aka fast enough, or we're not building trust in the process, which is extending to needing more than two or three calls. Hmm. Um, And so I start analyzing, okay, let's look at our deals won and deals lost. How long did those take? and I look at, okay, well, this took four calls. Well, why did it take four calls? And I can go back and I can listen to the recordings on call number two, which is typically when I would want you to try to close it. Call number three, max. And so I want to look at why couldn't we close? What questions were they asking? How could we have asked? How could we have answered those questions preemptively um, instead of waiting on on them to ask them on call three or four? Yeah. Or okay. Maybe you're noticing uh, a new decision maker gets injected in call number three. And it's like, well, why didn't I get that decision maker on call number two after I found that about them on call number one? Right? So those are things that I'd be analyzing is I'd just be asking why. And so yeah, those are the big things. I mean, I think you can look at, I mean, going back to the formula, ERG formula of pipeline times win rate times client value. What is why is our pipeline less? Why is our win rate less? Why are we not charging as much? Mm. And that could be your macro level. Um, and then you have all the more micro levels of average deal size and retention and uh, win rate. You could talk about like look at each individual step in your pipeline. Like why are people getting hung up here? You know, why are people spending 14 days in the commitment meeting category? Why are we not moving them to to closing actions or contract and payment section. So I think it's starting macro, looking at the big, big macro issues and then dialing in from there of like, okay, what are the issues that are at hand? Why is it taking so long or why are we closing less deals? Yeah. Um, Yep. Uh, So having actual data that is clean, that is easily accessible and that you can use to measure these things that's what I hear you saying is like, all right, I'm going to yeah. zoom back out. I'm going to measure the macro. And then based on what I find, because I know that these numbers are correct, mm-hmm. then I can double click on, you know, the next level. I can get into the micro. I can start to talk about trust. I can look at conversations. I can listen to yeah. call recordings, you know, whatever that next yeah. step is. 100%. Um, I, 
I think a lot of people's problems are they're, they don't know what to measure. Hopefully, if you've been listening to us for a while, you now know what to measure. Um, maybe they haven't built out systems that are accurately capturing data, so they have real-time actionable data. Um, but I like what you said. Zoom out, do an assessment, double-click. That's great. Yep. Su- super helpful. Um, let's end with a couple questions about like mindset or like self-improvement. Nice. Yeah. And then let me go close the deal at four. I know you got a call coming up. So well, then we'll, we'll keep it to this one. Dude, I, the rabbit hole that I just went down, I'm like, there are a billion things that I could learn about all of this. <laughs> and then there's a billion other things that I could learn about other things, right? Like there's just, dude, you talk about crypto and like I said, yep. uh, geopolitical like landscape and just like history and business and parenting and life and well like there's just a thousand things to know yep so my first question is how do you cut out the noise like i know you do a really good job of spending your time in places that are important for for the Mm -hmm. most part yeah um what have you done that's made that a reality for you um well i think it's it's there are a bunch of things you can learn so something i've done semi-recently is i have taken everything off my phone literally if you look at my phone right now my home screen with no pages this is the only page i have now and it's got clock calendar weather maps internet spotify notes email text telegram and so for me it's so I kind of created this thing. I'm sure I stole it from someone. I just called it something else 10 years ago, but it was it's called odd O D D. Is look at the things that and plot it out. There's an X and a Y axis. And on the horizontal axis, I don't know if that's I think it's X. Um you you put time, right? And and you want to look for the thing that um takes the most time or takes the least amount of time. So so the most time is technically on the far left side of the axis, right? Because I don't want things to take a bunch of time. It's actually a negative thing. So the negative is more time, less time is the positive. And then on the y-axis going vertical, you have at the top most value and least value. So you're going to create four quadrants. And I want you to think through the different elements of your life. Um, Go back into your calendar look at your calendar, look at the things. And I want you to start plotting things on this, 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 these four quadrants and and see, okay, does this take a lot of time and does it drive a little bit of value? Right? So the place you don't want to spend your time is what takes the most time and drives the least value. The place you want to optimize for is what takes the least amount of time that drives the most value. Right? So, writing my wife a letter before I go off to the office all day and can't talk to her doesn't take much time, drives a lot of value for my marriage. Worth doing. Okay? Those are things you... So plot all these things. And then uh, this is where odd um, uh, odd kind of gets pulled into this. So O stands for optimize. D stands for delegate. The second D stands for delete. So you want to look at everything in here. Basically, if it's in that bottom left quadrant of t- high time, low value, then I want to delete it. Not worth it. Social media, getting sucked down, watching Instagram stories, you know, whatever your thing might be. Um, if it's in the, the top right category. So the goal is this. Either you want to move something to the top right quadrant or start optimizing it towards that. How can you optimize this thing? So I found out a long time ago, I don't like to do um, lunches for networking. Yeah. And so what I'd rather do is invite someone to my office where I make coffee and we sit down for a 30-minute coffee. I don't have to do the 15-minute drive, the hour-long lunch, the 15-minute drive back. It's an hour and a half. That's a great great example. So it's an example of optimizing for something that I find is important. And so I've made it valuable. It's still high value, but now it's less time. So it's moving towards that top right quadrant. Um, delegate. Dude, I'm going to sit down. And, oh, sorry, I don't want to cut you off. I'm going to do this tonight. And yeah. it's going gonna, it's gonna to shit on my parade is what it's going to do. I yeah, but it's good for you. It's super good for you. And then to wrap it up kind of. So then the delegate part is what of this can I delegate to someone else? 
right? Is it something that's necessary, but not super important? Meaning it, you know, it, it takes a lot of time, but it's, you know, it, there's a, it's got mediocre value, but it's a necessary thing that I've got to do. Well, then is there things of, are there elements of it or can I entirely delegate this entire thing? And so either you plot this on the map, you cross out the things you got to delete, you do an arrow up and to the right that you got to optimize and you do a circle run things you can delegate. And you do that on a regular basis. All right. I do that. I've been doing that for 10 years. I do it probably once or twice a year, but it's kind of a way that... And one thing that I've tried before too is going back on your calendar and red, yellow, green. Go back to all the calendar events I had on my calendar. If it was worth doing and valuable, turn it green. If it was meh, turn it yellow. If it was a waste of my damn time, turn it red. And then I now have a color coordinated calendar that tells me the things that I shouldn't schedule in the future. That's so good, man. I was not expecting an entire framework, but uh, thanks there for sharing is. that. I know you got to go close a deal. I want to give you 60 seconds to prepare for this call, so we'll, we'll jump Thank off you. here. But as always, appreciate this. As always, appreciate you listening. If you're still with us, do all the things that make us feel warm and fuzzy. Rate, review, subscribe. If you're just listening, check us out on YouTube. Growing every day. One of these days, we'll have a 1,000 subscribers. It won't be too long from now. It'll be great. What's so funny is uh, this view been- count is super high, even though our subscribers are still only the 200s. It's all right. We'll get there. We'll get there. This has been another Friday edition of the Sales on the Rocks podcast. I am in Tahoe, so I love you, but I'm not thinking about you. Uh, We'll see you here next Friday. (laughs) Cheers. See you guys. Later.